Welcome back to A Beginner's Guide to Neural Mechanisms. In part two, I'll talk to you about philosophy of neuroscience. That is where philosophy of science meets neuroscience. So philosophy of neuroscience is really about the big questions in philosophy of science and how to view them through a neuroscientific lens. Traditionally, philosophy of science has been modeled on physics. That's sort of the model science that philosophy of science has considered. But physics and biology are very different. And so the standard questions in philosophy of science, when viewed through a neuroscientific lens, might look quite different. So one of the big topics in philosophy of science is laws of nature. It seems like there are laws of nature when you look at physics, but it's not at all clear that there are laws of nature in, when you look at neuroscience. So are there laws in neuroscience? Another big question is the way in which different levels of neuroscience interact. Um, in particular, the highest level, which you might think the psychological level, uh, seems quite different from looking at the biological level. So how are the neuroscientific and psychological levels related? Philosophers of neuroscience have given several different kinds of options for how they might be related. Uh, a very hardcore reductionist like John Bickle thinks that everything can be explained in molecular terms. The new mechanists have a different view in which there's a piecemeal reduction across levels. So nothing necessarily is completely reducible to uh, something like a neuro uh, or mo a molecular level. And then there are things like consciousness, which you might question are re reducible at all and different theories of emergence for how non-reducible phenomena can arise from operations of uh, complex systems in the brain. You might also ask how our neuroscientific tools impact the kind of data that we see. So everything is sort of filtered through the lens of the tools that we have, and none of our tools give us the whole picture. How do those tools affect the way that our data comes out looking to us, and how do we put the different pieces of data together again? And another question is, what counts as an explanation in neuroscience? There will be another video talking about these kinds of questions. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the areas in philosophy of neuroscience. Um, the, the breadth and diversity of neuroscience makes for many potential topics, some I think that haven't even begun to be explored. But some of the major topics are, for instance, a critical analysis of the neuroscientific methods we have and the norms that we have. So one example is the question of explanation in neuroscience, which is covered in another lecture in this series. Uh, another example is the question of the role of models in neuroscience. How do models work? What's the relation between a model and the target system? And how do we take uh, in insights from the operation of those models and apply them to our understanding of the brain? What are models doing anyway? Are they just descriptive? Are they mechanistic? What sorts of inferences can we make given the models that we have? Another general topic is uh, topics in philosophy of science seen through the lens of neuroscience. So questions in epistemology of science. How do we come to know things about the brain? What do our theoret theoretical constructs in cognition or in brain function amount to? For instance, what is memory? Does it really exist? Is there one kind of memory, many kinds of memories? Uh, these are questions that neuroscientists uh, address. There's the question of the theory-ladenness of observation. So again, what we see is colored by the tools that we have, and the tools are developed on the basis of theories that we have. Are we actually seeing the world in its bare form, or are we somehow affecting what we see by the way we observe it? And finally, neuroscience seems to be a very data-rich but theory-poor science, which is quite different from the standard model in philosophy of science, which is physics. Uh, what do we make of science when we have loads and loads of data and not a lot of theory by which to systematize it? So I want to just walk you through some of the more fine-grained topics in philosophy of neuroscience, just to get, again, a taste of what kinds of questions there are. So there are questions about our neuroscientific experimental methods. 
We can ask what they can tell us about the brain and how it functions. What can they tell us about the mind? Those things might be different. Can they tell us how those two things are related? How does mind arise from brain? We might ask what the correct cognitive ontology is. So if we're trying to understand cognition, what are the elements of cognition? What are their functional building blocks? Uh, are they stable? Do they vary depending on context? How do we figure out what they are? I'll discuss more about that in another lecture. We might talk about the use and justification of model systems, uh, not just computational models, but also the kinds of animal models that people typically use for figuring out basic things about biological function um, and the structures of ner nervous systems. So what model systems can we use to understand human cognition, for example, both normal function and disease? What inferences about human cognition or disease can we make from the behavior of model systems? So many neuroscientists use things like rats or monkeys in order to understand the functioning of the human brain, but obviously rats and monkeys aren't exactly like us. In which ways can we make inferences about us from what we learn about them? Uh, in which ways can we make inferences about disease and their treatments for, for, by investigating disease and treatment of non-human animals? We might ask questions about measurement and interpretation. So what do our experimental met methods measure? How do we design and calibrate devices to study something, that is the brain, that we don't yet understand? We don't even know what the most important basic coding mechanisms of the brain are, at least not for sure. So how do we build systems and devices in order to measure brain function and understand it properly? How does experiment relate to theory? We could ask questions about brain lesions and what happens uh, when you destroy or damage part of the brain. How does that in, uh, affect the functioning of the brain? What can lo those kinds of lesions tell us about the mind? What kinds of inferences can we make about normal brain function from seeing what happens when you damage parts of the brain? What kind of inferences can we make about disease or other kinds of dysfunction? So because the brain is such a complicated uh, organ, damaging part of it may also damage other parts of it. All sorts of things are interconnected. And how do you figure out what part of the dysfunction is due to the primary damage, what part is just due to accidental passage of certain kinds of fibers? Those are the kinds of questions that people who are thinking about the logic of lesion analysis try to deal with. There are questions about the ways in which we uh, interrogate the operation of the normal human brain and cognition. So neuroimaging uh, might tell us something about the nature of mental representation. Uh, but when we see aspects of the brain or brain functioning through our imaging techniques, that gives us only indirect access to brain function. So how do we make the, the jump between what we see from these imaging techniques and what's going on with brain function? Can we actually image mental states or processes? Can we get evidence of mental or neural representation from looking at these kinds of large-scale, non-invasive brain imaging techniques? Those are open questions that philosophers of neuroscience are dealing with. Neuroscientists are always developing novel methods of investigating the nervous system and also controlling it. So as neuroscience develops these kinds of tools, they're giving us, neuroscientists are getting unprecedented control over neurons, their electrical sig signals, neurochemistry, and even genes. So what do these novel methods allow us to do? And how do they affect the kinds of theories we can develop about the way the brain functions? And another topic is just the logic of inference in neuroimaging. What can we say about brain function by seeing correlations between brain activity and the, and the cognitive tasks that subjects do while in a brain scanner? What kinds of assumptions are we making in our reasoning? And are they warranted? For instance, does the brain work the same way when you're doing hypothetical kinds of tasks in a scanner as opposed to when you're faced with a situation in the real world? 
we make these kinds of inferences to try to understand what people do and how brains function in the real world, but the contexts are clearly different. So there are lots of questions about how to interpret neuroimaging that neuro philosophers of neuroscience think about. So I'm gonna walk you through uh, one example about the relationship between neuroimaging and psychology. So there's been a long-standing criticism of uh, functional neuroimaging um, from coming from the realm of psychology. It's a little dated, but I think it illustrates an important kind of debate in the philosophy of neuroscience literature. So some people have said that functional MRI cannot tell us anything interesting about the mind. So for example, Max Coulthart, who calls himself an ultra neuropsychologist says, uh, that the assertion is that this aim, that is for neuroscience to constrain psychology, is impossible to achieve in principle because facts about the brain do not constrain the possible natures of mental information processing systems. And he makes the uh, challenge that no neuroimaging research at the time he did it, he made this challenge was in 2006, but he said no neuroimaging research to date has yielded data that can be used to distinguish between competing psychological theories. So here's the problem. Coulthart's interested in figuring out how the mind works. And he says, there's nothing about brain data that's gonna constrain how the mind works. Another critical view on neuroimaging comes from the dynamical systems theorist. So here's an example of what a dynamical systems theorist might say. With respect to brain imaging studies, the conclusion that an observed pattern of dissociated brain regions demonstrates separate cognitive components simply affirms the inevitable consequent of assuming that there were single causes in the first place and applying linear statistical tools. If the original assumption of single causes is false, the statistical tools will nevertheless discover components. Thus, the su successful induction of single causes cannot be turned around to validate the root assumption. So what this complaint is saying is that the brain is a dynamical system and there aren't single causes or mental components to be found in the brain. But if you assume that there are, and you do some neuroimaging, you'll find things that you can interpret that way, and you'll basically ratify your assumptions. So both of these uh, types of views criticize the, uh, the aims of neuroimaging, which is to try to understand cognition by looking at brain function. So I'm gonna talk about uh, Coulthart's view, his challenge. Um, and he's made this quite precise uh, and put forward a challenge for neuroscientists to deal with. And so he says, this is what's required in order to show that neuroimaging can tell us something interesting about mind. He says, what's needed is to show that theory A predicts X while theory B predicts not X, where X is some pattern of neuroimaging data, and then show that there exists functional neuroimaging work which demonstrates that X is the case or demonstrates that not X is the case. So this seems like a simple challenge, right? He says, you have two theories and you're trying to adjudicate between them. They make different predictions and what neuroimagers need to show is that neuroimaging can make a prediction that distinguishes between these theories. Um, what I've argued is that the challenge as laid out is an impossible challenge because psychological theories predict functions or behaviors and not patterns of imaging data. So there is no pattern of imaging data that will satisfy Coulthart's challenge as stated. But there is a way to make sense of the challenge, and that is to allow bridge principles or auxiliary assumptions to allow one to infer function from location. So if you have a prediction from theory A that X and from theory B that not X, and you add an auxiliary assumption, something on the order of X causes activation in region F, then that's something that you might be able to test with neuroimaging. So a revised challenge, I think the only kind of reasonable challenge that someone like Coulthart could offer is something that must accept either that there's a body of statements, S1 to Sn, that specify functional anatomical mappings, or that there's a general principle that there is some systematic relation between function and brain location. And we actually have lots of evidence that there is a systematic relation between function and brain location. So there's very good reason to think that neuroimaging can meet Coulthard's challenge. And there are, in fact, 
lots of neuroimaging experiments that have been done at this point that do allow this kind of adjudication. Despite the fact that there are neuroscientific experiments that show that uh, there's activity in area F given a certain cognitive task and that one theory predicts activity in that area and another doesn't, that's not to say that the question has been completely settled. Worries still remain. For instance, can we discover function structure mappings by a technique that's already predicated on the existence of such a mapping? In order to do that, there would have to be some way of bootstrapping our knowledge on the basis of uh, earlier evidence to get later evidence that's even more precise or telling. There's another question about whether we can reach the proper ontology of uh, cognitive functions through our techniques, or whether the techniques that we start from and the theories that we intuitively begin from can get us there from where we are now. So these are actually pretty severe worries. They're, they're, they're serious worries. But if you look back at the history of science, it turns out that this is just science as usual. We are never handed ontologies on a silver platter. And to see that, you could look back at the history of chemistry, where people had thought that there was a substance called phlogiston that could explain burning. It turns out there's no such thing. But the development through bootstrapping of the table of elements and understanding of, of chemistry showed us that there's no phlogiston, but that there's also no need for it because the theory of burning is taken care of by understanding oxidation. So bootstrapping in science is the norm, and there's no algorithm for theory change. And we're just at a much earlier stage in neuroscience than we are in chemistry at this time. And there is reason to think that things like neuroimaging will get us to a better understanding of brain function. Thanks for watching. That's the end of part two.